here is an AT and T branded VTech manufactured 2.4 gigahertz corded cordless telephone. I got this telephone brand new old stock in the box recently, and it works perfectly fine. But as you can see here, the screen on the handset is completely unreadable. I'm pushing some buttons on the telephone, and the screen would normally be displaying different things, but we can barely make it out because too many pixels on the screen have stopped working. And same thing with the base. In fact, the base is even worse. Unfortunately, this kind of screen failure was very common on many VTech, AT&T, and General Electric models from the early and mid-2000s. Many of these telephones would start developing this failure early in their service life, even if they were never used. It's a very annoying failure because when the screen is like this, the telephones lose a lot of features like the caller ID, the directory, sometimes even the ring volume, because the menu cannot be navigated. The reason why this has happened is because the ribbon cable that connects the motherboard to the LCD screen is a very cheap component and the connection is partially deteriorating to the point that it's lost. To repair the screen we will need to reflow the contact points so that the ribbon is properly connected once again. It sounds complicated but the good news is it is possible to repair the screens at home with small common household tools and I'm going to show you exactly how to do it and what tools we'll be using in just a few moments. Now before we begin, just a couple things to note. This repair will only work on screens that are partially failing, most likely from the aforementioned brands of VTech, AT&T, and General Electric. This repair will not work on Panasonic telephones in which the screen is 100% blank. Panasonic did not use the same type of ribbon cable as VTEC and General Electric, so this repair method is completely incompatible with most Panasonic brand telephones. Depending on which telephone model you have, the difficulty of accessing the ribbon cable will vary. Be warned that on some models it will be necessary to desolder wires to access the ribbon and then resolder those wires during the reassembly process. I will assume for this video that you know how to solder electronic components should it be necessary for you to do so. I estimate the difficulty of this repair to be an intermediate level, but please watch the video all the way through before attempting for yourself so you know exactly what you're in for. This repair is not permanent. The screen will work again, but it will likely begin to fail again in the same manner within a few years time. To permanently fix the screen, we would need to replace the cheap ribbon cable with one that is far more durable, but this is almost impossible to do without expensive industrial equipment. And finally, remember to wear your safety glasses, disconnect any power, phone lines, and batteries from the telephones, and please do not burn yourself on the soldering iron. I cannot be held responsible for any personal injury or damaged equipment as a result of following the procedures shown in the video, so please do so at your own risk. The tool we'll be using to reflow the connection is a typical soldering iron with this specialized tip called a T-tip, as in the letter T. This T-tip consists of the shaft and then a metal bar with a piece of flat heat resistant rubber attached to the end. This rubber is typically included with the tip when you purchase it. This tip is very inexpensive on eBay or Amazon. Just search for a soldering iron T-tip and you'll find lots of options. T-tip shafts come in different thicknesses depending on the wattage rating of your soldering iron. So be sure to purchase one that will fit your iron. You will need several sizes of Phillips head screwdrivers to take apart the telephone. Depending on what model telephone you have, you may need a spudger or a thin flathead screwdriver to assist in separating plastic tabs. And I like to have a set of tweezers or small needle nose pliers. 
in case I need to guide wires in hard to reach areas or to hold wires in place when I'm soldering so I don't have to get my fingers too close to the iron. All right, so we are finally ready to begin to get started here. We're gonna start with the base because it's all about the base and I've already disconnected the cords and the handset. The first thing they'll probably need to do is remove the wall mount or the table mount bracket. Not every phone will have one, but this particular one does. Usually the instructions for how to remove it are printed right on it so it can easily be removed. In this particular case, the arrow is pointing up, so I just need to slide upward and then pull forward to remove it. Now that the bracket is removed, the next step will be to remove any screws that you can see. Generally the screws are a standard Phillips head size, but unfortunately depending on how much the manufacturer doesn't want you opening the phone, the screws won't always be obvious. Make sure you check underneath any warranty stickers like this purple one here, and also underneath the rubber feet if it looks like there aren't any other screws near that area. You can peel the rubber feet off with a small flathead screwdriver. After you've removed all the screws, you may find that the base still does not freely come apart at the seam. If this is the case, there's probably one or multiple plastic snaps or tabs around the edge holding it together as well. To separate these tabs, you'll need to open the seam far enough to insert your flathead screwdriver or spudger into it ever so slightly and slowly work your way around until the snaps give. I did not need to do that for this base unit, but I will need to for the handset later. So if you want to see exactly how this is done, feel free to skip ahead to the handset portion. So now the base is coming apart. You want to make sure you open the base very carefully and slowly without any more force than you need. Because sometimes there may be delicate connections between a circuit board on the bottom half and a circuit board on the top half. It'll be a whole other headache to redo those connections if you happen to break them. In my case, a ribbon near the side is attaching the two boards, so it's unfolding like a book. And that's about as far as it'll go. And right here, this white plastic piece with the thin circuit board is our screen assembly. This is what it'll be working with. On this particular phone, it's very easily accessible but that will not be the case on a lot of other phones. You may need to remove several components, sometimes even the entire front circuit board to access the screen which resides underneath. Just pay careful attention to where it all goes and how it came apart. Take pictures or video if you have to, and you should be just fine putting it back together again. Here's a close-up of the screen assembly. And this right here, what looks like this brown sheet of plastic with these tiny lines in it, is our cheap faulty ribbon cable. This is called a carbon ribbon cable and these are notorious for this kind of problem. So there's four screws around the outside of this assembly. I'm gonna remove those now. And then the whole thing comes out. Now again, I can't stress this enough. This is one of the most delicate parts of the inner workings of the phone. So if you know you're not a gentle patient type or you have shaky hands, I would strongly recommend finding some help with this project. And here's a closer look at this ridiculous ribbon. Now our ultimate goal here is going to be to get to the part of the LCD and the part of the circuit board that the carbon ribbon cable attaches to. On this particular assembly, those things are inaccessible with it assembled, so I have to disassemble it. So I'm going to start by peeling off this felt insulator here because it's holding the LCD inside the assembly. I'm going to ultimately need to get the LCD out of there to access where the ribbon attaches to it. Sadly I kind of broke it a little but sometimes it's almost impossible not to because that material tends to get brittle and disintegrate with age. Fortunately it's not a critical component so we don't need to worry about it too much. Now there's several tabs that are holding the LCD in place. There's two on the left and three on the right here. The two on the left are not designed to move at all, they're just anchors. So I need to start on the right side where the tabs will bend outward. So I'm going to attempt to bend all these tabs enough to lift the LCD up and out. 
And again, this is an extraordinarily delicate process. If you break that ribbon off, that's game over. There's no fixing it after that. There we go, that's lifted out. And the underside of the LCD right here is where the ribbon cable is attached. That's exactly what we want. Next we have to get this circuit board out of the assembly. This isn't as delicate as the screen, so you can see I'm using the flathead to help me out. Just make sure not to scratch any traces with it. I also had to remove some of that glue by the much better ribbon cable there. That gray ribbon cable is far better, and ultimately that's what the LCD should have used. So I'm just going around looking for any of those plastic tabs that can be bent back and putting my screwdriver in the slots to help me remove it. Here's a look at the underside of that circuit board. These 10 LED lights that are spread out here shine onto the diffuser under the LCD screen, and this makes up the backlight. Pretty neat. Unfortunately, I only have the length of that gray ribbon cable to work with, so I can't move the screen too far away from the phone, which makes it very difficult to find a good place to put it. So I opted to use a block of this soft cushion material. Now comes the fun part. I got my T-tip all warmed up here. Now what we're going to do is just touch the rubber pad down onto the ribbon and apply a generous amount of pressure. Not so much so that you feel like it'll break, but just enough that the rubber has a good even contact to the ribbon all the way across as much as possible so it can transfer enough heat to it. Make sure the metal part of the tip does not contact anything at any point, especially the ribbon. It'll melt through it in no time. And depending on the wattage or the temperature of the soldering iron, that will dictate how long before you should lift it back up. This is a 30 watt iron, so I can safely keep pressure for 15 to 20 seconds. If you have a 40 or 45 watt iron, you should wait 8 or 10 seconds or so before lifting it off. And if you have a 65 watt iron, I wouldn't go any longer than 5 seconds. My particular T-tip is kind of cheesy because at the time that I bought it, I didn't know if it was going to work or not, so I didn't want to invest in one if there was uncertainty surrounding it. So on my tip, the rubber doesn't sit down in there completely flat, and therefore doesn't make as consistent of a connection to the ribbon as would be ideal. So what I'm doing here is I'm just using the corner of it and going all along the length of the ribbon, and that's ensuring that every one of those traces is getting attention. no way of knowing if the process is working until you power the phone on and look at the screen again. So I'm going to plug the base back in, making sure I'm not touching any electronic components in there in the meantime. And we can see that there is already a drastic improvement. The screen is once again readable, and in fact it's almost 100%. So I'll unplug it and use the T-tip again, this time on the LCD side of the ribbon connection, in case there's any bad traces there. Just keep using it on both sides until the screen is fully repaired. Keep in mind that the ribbon connection has to cool before you'll get to see the final result. Sometimes when you just got done using the tool, the pixels won't be there. 
but a few seconds later after the connection has cooled they will appear. And there we go. All the pixels are on and working. Now comes the satisfying part. To reassemble we'll just do what we did to disassemble in reverse order. So I'm going to put the LCD screen and the circuit board back into the white piece of plastic. Of course obeying the tabs and the anchors. And screw it in. I'm folding the base back together and making sure the two halves close flush and tight. And testing out the screen one last time, just to make sure it's all working correctly. Looks good. Screwing the base back together. And finally, attaching the bracket. Success! Now we will take a look at the handset. This will probably be a little easier, again, depending on which model you have. Also, most cordless handsets come apart the same way, so this video will be a little more universal demonstration for the handset than it was for the base. This will cover more handset models than perhaps the base tutorial covers. To begin, I will remove the battery cover. Most of the time it just slides downward like that. Next, the battery must be removed. It's held in there with clips in this particular model, so I needed some assistance from the spudger. Just don't puncture the pack if you're doing it this way. And then unplug it. Now you'll see two screws on either side toward the bottom there. Sometimes there's four screws with another set of two residing near the center of the handset. Just remove all those. After removing all the screws, the handset will begin to split apart at the bottom where those screws were, but it will still be firmly attached together near the top. Now what's holding the top together is some plastic snaps on the sides that will need to be undone. Sometimes these can be undone just by hand, but you risk using too much force and breaking something on the inside, so I like to use the spudger or thin flathead screwdriver. To do this, open the seam near the bottom by hand, just far enough to insert the spudging tool, but don't insert it too far so you don't contact anything delicate inside. Now you can either move it up and down, or rotate it slightly to separate the seam. Did you hear that? That was the sound of one of the snaps unlocking, and we see now that the seam is open farther than it was. Now that it's open, we can move our spudging tool to that portion that just opened up and open the next snap. And there's only one or two snaps on each side. Repeating the process for the other side. And now that all the snaps are undone, the back cover should unhinge at a focal point at the top of the handset. A warning, if there's a speakerphone in the handset, be very careful when unfolding it as you don't want to break the connection to the speaker. If you break that connection, you'll have to re-solder it. Another thing you want to be careful of is the antenna. If it's rubber, it tends to break very easily because it's become brittle with age. The next thing we want to do is look for any screws that appear to be holding components in place. Sometimes there's some holding in the charge contacts, in this case not because the contacts are soldered in. Sometimes there's one in the center. In this case I see one on the board here with an arrow pointing to it and another recess down here. There's also four more screws with arrows pointing to them on the main board here. So now this smaller board unfolds upward like that and I can access this one additional screw underneath it. 
Now this part was a little tricky. The handset isn't designed very well. Unfortunately, I didn't get the whole thing on video, but what I had to do was sort of bend the sides of the plastic shell outward and then unfold the motherboard starting on the side opposite the headset jack. That headphone jack was holding the motherboard in place, so once we remove the opposite side, you can slide the headphone jack out of there and the hold will release. Now everything should come loose, except the earpiece speaker in some cases. On this model, the earpiece is already free because we previously undid its housing, but on other models it could be held in with some additional screws or an entire housing. Again, document the process of removing it as best you can, and take pictures or video if you have to, and you should be fine during the reassembly process. So here's the front of the handset, and this is also a good opportunity to wash out the front of the handset shell and buttons if they're dirty, and also to clean the button contacts, which are those black or gold circles you see there. If your buttons aren't working very well, some isopropyl rubbing alcohol on a cotton swab will do wonders for those. Now we have to start looking for how to get the screen out of this assembly here. I see a screw up there, so I'm going to unscrew that first. And it actually looks like that was all that was needed. Sometimes the white piece of plastic is attached to the motherboard with two or four tabs, which you can bend outward to remove it. Here's our culprit. This brownish piece of plastic with the tiny lines on it, is our problematic carbon ribbon cable. This ribbon usually attaches to the LCD and then either the motherboard itself or a separate display controller circuit board on the other side of the screen assembly or this white piece of plastic. Our goal is to get to where this ribbon is attached on both the screen and the board so that we can access and reflow the connections. Of course, this phone has to have this ridiculous copper sticker thing covering the ribbon's connection to the screen, so I need to pull this sticker off to repair that connection. And this is very scary because lifting this adhesive could very well lift the ribbon along with it. And if that happens, it's game over. There's no repairing it after that. Unfortunately, the heat will not transfer through this, so it definitely has to be lifted off. Now, on the contrary to what we just went through there, one of the very convenient designs of this particular handset is the fact that both the ribbon's attachment points are accessible while the screen is visible. So we can go ahead and plug the battery back in now, of course making sure not to touch any electronics while we're at it, and we can watch the screen live as we're working to see it come back to life. So now it's time to reflow. I've got the T-tip all hot and ready to go. Now what we want to do is the same thing we did with the base, and I'll repeat the process in case you didn't watch the base portion. So we're going to just place the rubber pad down here onto the connection, and we're going to apply a generous amount of pressure. Again, not so much that you feel like it will break, but just enough that the rubber has an even contact to the ribbon all the way across the length of it, and will transfer enough heat. Make sure the metal part of the tip does not contact the ribbon at any point because it will melt right through. And again, that's game over when that happens. Now depending on the wattage or temperature of your soldering iron, that will dictate how long before you should lift it back up. This happens to be a 30 watt iron, so I can safely keep pressure for 15 to 20 seconds. If you have a 40 or 45 watt iron, you should wait. 8 to 10 seconds or so, and if you have a 65 watt iron, I wouldn't go any longer than 5 seconds at a time. Now after so many rounds, especially if you have a hotter soldering iron, you'll want to lift it up and let the phone cool down. Once the connection cools, you'll see realistically how much of the screen has been repaired. If not all of the pixels are back on, try again in a different spot. Sometimes you can use just the corner of the T-tip to stimulate a certain area. And just keep going until the entire screen comes back to life.
Looks like just the motherboard connection was faulty here, so I didn't even need to bother removing that copper strip after all. Oh well. I'm filling the screen with eights, and every pixel is working. Voila, or whatever. Now comes reassembly, where we're just doing exactly what we did before, but in reverse order. Putting that screw back in. Then the motherboard back down. Inserting the headphone jack into the slot first, and then lowering the other side into place. Feeding the antennas back in. Inserting all the screws. Putting the back shell back on, starting from the clamp on the top and working my way down. To reconnect the battery, we're going to want to make sure the two colors of the wires going into the plug match the diagram printed down there. And just push it down. Alright, and here is our before and after. I'm going to fill the screens with eights, and you can see that every single pixel is working perfectly. We can finally read the caller ID once again. If you have any questions at all, please look at the description box first, as I will have put any frequently asked questions in there. And if you can't find an answer there, then by all means post a comment, and I will get back to you as soon as I can. Thanks very much for watching, and I hope this has helped you fix your telephones or any other device you can think of with a screen that has dead pixels.